Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Bible Breakdown Podcast with your host, Pastor Brandon. Today, Romans chapter 8, and the title of this one is just, But God. <laughs> I mean, just, But God. He can do everything, man. I'm going to tell you something. Spoiler alert. This is my favorite chapter in the book of Romans. I'm just going to tell you. I know I shouldn't say that because we still got some more chapters to go. They're all like a really close second. Like I love Romans 12. This is my jam right here. It's going to be so good. I can't wait to get into this. But as always, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much for helping us on the road to 1,000. We are trying to break that record maybe by the end of the year. So thank you so much for sharing this with everybody. It blesses my soul to see this community that the Lord is helping us build. Also, if you like what we're doing here, also go to the podcast. Podcast listeners, you guys are my favorite. I'm so thankful for you, and you guys are getting out in force as well. The Bible Breakdown community is growing, and man, it's, it's awesome. Thank you so much. And we all gather over at the Facebook group, Bible Breakdown Discussion, and just do life together. So thank you guys so very much. Now, if you want to get your Bibles with me, we're going to jump right into this because, man, this is absolutely awesome. As we're going to be reading out the New Living Translation, chapter 8. I love this because, you know, the journey has been building, and this is where we want to be. Because as we realize, chapter 1, 2, and 3 talk about the problem. Born into sin. Nobody's exempt. The law shows us that we're never going to get there, right? It's the law, of the, the righteous, holy perfection is above what we can do. Sounds like we need a Savior, right? So chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6 talk about how when we turn our lives over to God, we have that believing loyalty in Him, we can experience newness of life in Christ. And then, man, I love chapter 7 yesterday, where Paul just, he kind of just lets us in the room a little bit. Like, he's like, brings us all in the same room and says, you know what? You're not perfect. But before you start feeling too bad, me neither. We're all slowly growing toward freedom every single day. We have good things we want to do. We don't do it. We got bad things we don't want to do. We do it. That's life, right? And we're always growing toward freedom. But then here's the amazing thing. He talks about life in the Spirit. When we allow Christ to take over our lives and we slowly start growing toward freedom every single day, we get to experience what chapter 8 talks about, about the future glory of God and that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. So we're going to read this together, and I love this so much because he really talks about what doing life with God is like, about how there is this war in our life where we have the remaining sin natures in us that are trying to take over. But slowly, as we grow in the kingdom of God, those things start slowly being lost. It reminds me of when we read through the book of Joshua, how as the nation of Israel moved into the promised land, the other nations slowly got weaker and weaker and weaker as the nation of Israel got stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's how we grow in the kingdom of God. As we grow, those sins and those addictions and those things get weaker and weaker and weaker as his power grows in us. And then we realize that nothing can separate us from him. So I'm done gushing for a moment, just for a moment. We're going to read this together. So if you have your, your Bibles with me, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says this, Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus, because you belong to him. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we have as sinners. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Now, pause. Now, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Paul said in verse 1, we no longer have condemnation. We no longer live under condemnation. Condemnation is that sin nature that says, you messed up, you're never going to be good enough. Conviction is say, hey, you messed up, but man, let's use it to get closer to God. One draws us away from God. The other draws us toward God. So if you ever sin and you feel something inside of you, ask yourself, is that drawing me oh, further away from God? Or is that saying, yeah, I messed up. Man, let me take that to God and let him wash away any of that sin that, and let it, so I can find freedom. 
then you'll know the difference. Condemnation from the enemy, don't pay attention. Conviction from the Holy Spirit, letting it draw you closer to him. And what God's word just said was, we could not be holy. We couldn't be sinless. We messed up before we even realized we were messing up. That's why Jesus came. And that because of what he did, now we can follow him in spirit and in truth. Verse five says this, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile toward God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you who are not controlled by your sinful nature... But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as the body raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life and give it to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. In other words, he's saying there's a difference between your spirit and your body. Your body will one day die, but your spirit will then be united with Christ. Verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. So, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. And we now call Him Abba, Father. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ... We are heirs of God's glory, and if we are to, sh- but but if we are to share His glory, we must also share His suffering. Now that was a big mouthful, but what he was saying is, is that now we are no longer God and creation, but He has adopted us into His family. And that doesn't mean we become little gods. Okay, that's that's that is uh, that's that's heresy, but what it means is that we have now been adopted into the ability to be in His spiritual family. We're not God but we are treated as his special creation, his special treasure. So it is a, an, an analogy, a metaphor to help us understand how God views us, not as a lowly creation, but as his special creation, his children that we now walk with him in fellowship. Restores Genesis 3, when the Bible said that God wanted to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, but he couldn't. It restores this back again. So now we don't just have the relationship of calling God, God, but we can call him Father as well. And that's what that word Abba means. It's an Aramaic word, which means a a close name for Father, like like Daddy. But it's not meant in a a disrespectful way, but it's as if you know this person. This is not just your Father, but a close relationship. That's what God wants from us, is he wants us to be close in relationship with him. All right, let's keep going. Verse 18. Yet... What, uh, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later, which, by the way, I forgot to mention that. That's part of what it is to be a Christian, is that when we are a Christian, not everybody will agree with us. Not everybody will support what we are doing. And if they crucified Christ, then we're going to suffer for our relationship with him. That just becomes part of us. But it is nothing to compare to with what God is doing in us and what he will do in us in the future. Verse 19. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation is subjected to God's curse. But we eager, we, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Think about that for a moment. When Adam and Eve sinned, sin not only came into mankind, humankind, but also all of the animals and everything that were under the authority of Adam and Eve. So what Paul is saying is the entire world is under the curse that Adam caused. And they long for the day 
when all of sin is removed from the earth so that they can enjoy the freedom that they were created for as well. It's verse 22. Let's read that again. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present. In other words, they're longing with pain to be delivered of this sinful nature. Verse 23. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including new bodies that he has promised. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope. But if we look forward to something we don't have, then we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The Father who knows all the hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, but the Spirit leads us believers in harmony with God's will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself and has given them that right standing. He gave them his glory. Now, there's a whole lot there that we don't have a chance to really sit and talk about because this would be a four hour deal. And so we're not going to have a chance to go there. But I'm interested for you to look up a lot of these things and go to the Bible breakdown discussion and let us know what you find. But to tell you really quickly, one of the things the Bible says is that the Holy Spirit is a foretaste of the glory that will be revealed. In other words, when you're in your time of worship and you feel something, that's the Holy Spirit, possibly, that is encouraging your heart. When you're reading God's Word and something comes to your mind and you're enlightened and you're encouraged, you experience joy, it's the Holy Spirit leading you. The Bible says that He is our counselor, our helper, our hope, our leader, and our guide. That's the Holy Spirit uniting with us already. We can't be with the Holy Spirit completely because we're still in this mortal body. But that is the beginning of what it's like to be in complete union with God. And even when there's times when we don't know what to pray for, we don't know how to pray. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will then give us the wisdom to pray through us so that we're able to pray the mind of God. And then he says that because the Holy Spirit is working through us, all of the things going on in our life, he is going to shape them and mold them to work for our good. doesn't mean they're always going to be good, but they'll work for our good in all things. And then the last thing, make sure you understand, when he says that, that the son would be the firstborn among those, that word first, firstborn is an is a unfortunate translation because it is, is meant to be unique. In other words, Jesus wasn't born. He was saying, we're using the word son because that helps you understand the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. But me being a child of God, and because I'm a male, that makes me a son of God. But I'm not the same as the Son of God. So I know that that can get kind of complicated, but I just want to make sure you understand what it says in verse 29. For God knew his people in advance. He chose them to become like his son, not his son, like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So take out the word firstborn, and a, a better word to describe that Greek word would be unique. There is a, it's a word that's called par excellence, which means one of a kind. So in other words, it would say, a better way to say this would be, for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to be like his son, so that his unique son would be just as brothers and sisters to all of them. In other words, invited into the family. The reason why that's important is when you get into other faiths, such as um, Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints people, there is some aberrant heretical doctrine that says that Jesus wasn't eternally existing, but that at some point he began to exist. And then now, when we're adopted into the family, we're now in the same status with Jesus, and we grow into becoming gods. If you don't read this carefully, you could see how they would get that, but that's not at all what God's Word is saying. Jesus was eternally existing in the past, 
in the very beginning, the Bible says in John John 1, in the beginning was the Word. That's, that's a, a metaphor for Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created through him. Nothing was created that was created without him. And so therefore, it's to say, when it says firstborn, it's saying he's the unique one. He is God. But all of you, when you come in, you become like that as far as in now you are part of the family. Does that make sense? <laughs> that's, that's what it is, trying to understand God. You go, I think so, Pastor. I'm not so sure. Right. All right. Let's finish up because this is my favorite part. Here we go. Verse 31. What should we say then about such wonderful things as these? In other words, we're part of the family. If God is for us, who could ever be against us? It's like that little kid that when they're getting picked on, they go, if you don't me stop messing with me, I'm going to go get my big brother. That's what Paul is saying. Since he did not even spare his unique son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us to whom God has chosen to be his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. And here it is. I love this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or are threatened with death? As the scriptures say in the Old Testament, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Here we go. I am convinced that nothing can ever, ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Man. You know, what is the application point for today? And that is this, that when we no longer live according to the flesh, we live according to the Spirit. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. It does mean that we're no longer bound by the law of sin and death, but we're walking toward freedom every day. And that's a deep thing. It's a theological thing that we have to dig and find and understand. But the more we seek and the more we dig, the more we find. And the bottom line is this, man, God loves me. I'm part of the kingdom of God. I've been called a child of God. I am not the child of God. I'm not the son of God. That's, that's God. But he uses those metaphors to help me understand the familial relationship he wants to have with me. And because of that, I have eternal confidence. You got no idea who my Jesus is. So no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And so what does that mean for us today? Maybe you're struggling in an area in your life. Maybe it's a sin issue. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe it's disappointment, unmet expectations. I don't know what it could be. But can I tell you, not even that can get God to change his mind about you. He loves you. He is for you. And it is our joy to dig and to see in fresh ways the amazing glory of God and to realize he is for us more than we can imagine. Let's pray together right now. God, thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness. Thank you, God, that you love us more than we can stand and that our love for you, it ebbs and flows at times. We struggle from time to time, but not you. Your love for us grows every day. I pray that we'll, you'll help us to realize that though seasons change and relationships change, you never do. You're with us and you're for us, and we celebrate that today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. My prayer for you is that you will say, as God's word says, that I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is what? The power of God at work and everyone who believes. My prayer for you today is that you will experience that good news and you'll share it with someone today because it is the most glorious news we can imagine. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow for Romans chapter 9.